Well, welcome everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. First, welcome to the Cape Cod Maritime Museum's Winter 2023 Lecture Series. Very happy to be uh, kicking things off in the new year. We hope you all had wonderful holidays. So I'm Mary Everett Patrickwin, the museum's public programs coordinator, and behind the scenes making all the technological wizardry happen is, as always, our executive director, Elizabeth York. Um, before we get started, just a couple of um, housekeeping tips. First, we do ask that you um, mute and turn off your camera during the presentation. This is just so that all the focus can be on today's speaker. Uh, and um, please, if you need to use the chat, um, you can use the chat um, uh, button for two things. One, if you're having any technological issue, your sound isn't um, coming through, anything like that, please just type your issue into the chat and Elizabeth um, back in the virtual sphere will text back to you and tell you uh, how you can resolve that. Um, also, if you have questions for today's speaker, please check Put those in the chat. Uh, as per usual, um, our speaker will be answering all the questions at the end of the presentation, but you can type them into the chat at any time that you think of them. So uh, we hope that you uh, will go ahead and do that. So um, for today's speaker, um, we're very happy to welcome Dr. Roger Hanlon from Woods Hole's Marine Biological Laboratory. He has a PhD um, from the Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science uh, at the University of Miami. I think I got all that right. Um, and uh, his specialty is color changing marine animals. So this is a topic that um, I'm absolutely fascinated by. Um, so we're very happy to have you with us, Dr. Hanlon. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Mary and Elizabeth. Really uh, happy to be here. So let me share my screen and see if we can get rolling here. And can everyone see that okay? Okay, is that pretty good? Roger. Yes. Mary, is it good? Yep, you look fine. Okay, good. So we'll go ahead and start. Well, uh, thanks everyone for taking the time uh, to listen today a little bit about some of the work we've been doing here in Woods Hole. Uh, the title is a little different, Rapid Adaptive Coloration is what I'm very interested in. But in today's talk, I want to take you diving, number one, now where the action is. And I want to bring in not only the science involved in what these marvelous animals can do, but also how we use art and science to interpret what they do. And I, my colleagues and I work together, not only with biologists and chemists and physicists, but also with folks who make materials and cool gizmos through engineering. And so I'll give you a flavor for all of that. I mean, it's Sunday afternoon, we should be having fun. So hopefully uh, this presentation will be a little bit fun. So let's start off uh, with some acknowledgements. Uh, I've had wonderful colleagues, students, PhD students, master's students, and postdocs, and lots of uh, institutions that work with, and a lot of different funding agencies. So uh, much uh, gratitude for all the good help we've gotten to get these data together. So here we are diving and we're underwater and we're in a back reef area and there's just that uh, rock there and a fish swimming around, nothing's happening till now. And there was an octopus there the whole time. Uh, I took this film, this is not uh, manufactured in Photoshop or anything else. Uh, and when you look in reverse, you really begin to see the details of what's going on. Uh, so here we see in reverse, you're gonna get the idea of smooth white skin, a ring develops around the eye, if you can see my pointer, that's 5 million little dots in the skin called pigmented chromatophores. Another 25 million show up in the body pattern, here it comes. Watch the smooth outline of the body on the right of the animal, and you see that the skin has actually morphed into three dimensions. So all of this is controlled by the brain, which is a very large brain, I'll point out soon. And so it's really quite a dramatic, impressive thing uh, that these animals are doing. So the before and after is pretty dramatic. So we study many aspects of this. We're looking at the morphing of the skin, we're looking at the anatomy of the animal's skin, we look at the sensory integration because this is driven by visual. Uh, the animals are looking in the background, making a decision of which camouflage pattern to put on. So it's quite a marvelous and very efficient and very speedy system. So why do they do this? Well, here's the answer right here. 
and you can see that barracuda right there. Yes, barracudas eat octopuses, and so do many other carnivorous fishes on coral reefs and kelp forests and elsewhere. So there's a lot of pressure on these animals. Uh, and we're talking about predators that have phenomenal vision. So this system of camouflage is tuned to the superb vision of various fishes and birds, mammals, yes, diving mammals, eat cephalopods like seals. And these are animals that can, some can see color, some can see polarization, some can see at night, some can see in the UV. They all have good visual acuity. And these are visual features that are better than our visual features by far. Okay, so here's my research bias right from the beginning. I'm interested in the whole organism. That's where I start my study, the octopus or the squid or the cuttlefish or, you know, the grouper that changes color. And so we take an integrative approach, which means that we study things from the organismal level, but we go all the way down to the molecular and even the genetic level. And conversely, we go up to the ecological level. So, you know, if I describe what I really am as a biologist, I, I study sensory ecology. In other words, I want to know what senses an animal is using to get information from the environment it's in and how it operates within that ecological context. And so I do a lot of field work, but we also do lab experiments where we can control the environment a little bit more. So here's the key thing. These animals can change, as you saw in the first video, in less than one second. So uh, it drives, you know, some interesting questions. But one of them is, how many camouflage patterns uh, do you need to go out on a coral reef with thousands of backgrounds in a coral reef, the most complex visual environment on the planet? And so, you know, we can use this animal, which can go anywhere and camouflage in a second or two, might have some answers about how to solve that riddle. So here's my uh, talk outline. I'm going to start off with talking about camouflage patterning and complex signaling. In other words, what all this color change is for. Number two, I'm going to look at what sensory input the animals are using to make the decision to change the pattern. And by the way, that pattern change is not a reflex it's a really complex brain decision. Number three, we're gonna look at the skin itself and see how it makes all these changes. And number four, we're gonna see how engineers and material scientists use that information to make things that we want to change color, like your clothes or your car or your house and you name it. And that's not very much possible in our current world. So maybe the animal world can give us some insight into that. So what is camouflage? Well, I call it the least studied subject in biology that we think we already know about. Oh, it's just looking like the background. Wrong. <laughs> it's much more complicated and interesting than that, which I'll point out shortly. So how does it work? Well, here's the um, Hollywood's version of how it works. We got the Harry Potter invisible cloak, uh, and that's a cool story, but of course it's not real. But what is real is the factual information I'm going to give you now and the story of how these animals do this is really stranger than fiction. All right, what does camouflage have to uh, really achieve? So watch this video here of an octopus that I filmed in Palau, Micronesia. And the animal is not camouflaged at the moment, it's foraging, but it is changing its pattern and its appearance 170 times per hour but watch this animal being very conspicuous on purpose, moves up onto this coral promontory and decides to settle there. Now watch it, very conspicuous, light and dark. And now it just decides to stop, looks at its surroundings and goes, got it. Now, if you look right at that scene right there, are you really going to see and recognize an octopus? Probably not because I've been swimming over them and missing them for years. So what is it about this. This is what I would call a generalist solution. It's come up with a general pattern design that works in a very complex environment. So we're trying to sort out those details. So there are hundreds of background features. What did our octopus cue on? Did it do this coral or that one or that one or that one? And uh, we have a lab essay that I'll describe in a minute and how we sort that out. Okay, so camouflage is not being very visible. Signaling is just the opposite. It's being conspicuous. To get that full range requires some kind of color, some kind of pattern. But all of these things are very tied into specific behaviors. The animals just can't be a certain color and pattern. If they, do, they don't do the right behavior, it's going to be detected. So this depends on the light field, 
uh, the optics involved by the predator and the prey, and the visual perception. All of these things are things that we study independently, but then coherently in the end. Okay, so we have this fancy scientific term, rapid neural polyphenism. You know what a phenotype is, just what an animal looks like. So if you have more than one look alike, you're poly. Uh, and so these animals, here's a cuttlefish right here signaling, and the very same cuttlefish can look like that, or that, or that, or that, or that. And if you look at the animals in each one of these, its appearance is quite different. These are all camouflage patterns of different types, uh, but they can do this instantaneously. So there's a lot of phenotypic expression that these animals can give us. Now, how fast is it? It is really fast. Uh, rapid neural polyphenism. And this squid right here uh, has changed in a fraction of a second. Uh, this um, cuttlefish right here in two thirds of a second has popped up from smooth to these papillae, we call them, the bumps in the skin. And this animal down here, which you'll see in a video in a moment, can go from fully conspicuous to fully camouflaged in about a second, 1.2 seconds. So there's a lot going on uh, with this uh, process. So this is built in a system that uses the nervous system to create the control and the speed. If you want to change color slowly, like a chameleon or other animals we're aware of, uh, then you do it with hormones, which have to be dispersed into the bloodstream, and that takes a long time by um, <clears throat> comparison. So here's that same animal on Okinawa Reef, and it just stops right in front of me, and it's just hard to see, even though it's like 12 inches away. So they can really do this very efficiently. Now this is the giant Australian cuttlefish. This is a, a big animal. It's very conspicuous and the skin is smooth. I didn't have a video camera, but I shot my still images one second at a time. So if we play this, you'll see in five seconds, five clicks, it disappears. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five. I'm looking like an algae. And then it comes back out and looks more like a cuttlefish. So these cuttlefish can do the same thing uh, with great discretion. Now, what are the tactics of camouflage? I'm gonna just bend them into three kinds of camouflage to give you some orientation. There's background matching. This is what everyone thinks camouflage is, looking like the background. It doesn't have to look exactly like the background, and that's important, but this is not to be detected. But a lot of animals are gonna get detected because if it's a three-dimensional animal, and it's on a two-dimensional background, you know, it's going to get detected by any predator. But in that case, they have to use a different trick. Uh, and they use disruptive coloration, which is not blending in with the background necessarily, but looking unlike what you really are. This doesn't look much like a cuttlefish, nor does this. So that disruptive coloration is a very important feature that they do. And the third thing is just not to look like themselves at all. That's called masquerade. Mimicry is one form of masquerade where uh, this is a cuttlefish down here. And it's out on the sand plain and there's a piece of algae and a rock right here. So it decides to look like that rock. It's masquerading as something that it really isn't. Okay, and then there's mimicry looking like another animal. So every cuttlefish can show these different images. And we asked ourselves initially, well, how many camouflage patterns are there in this animal? And we looked at a whole group of octopus images underwater, and we had to make some sense out of this big, uh, confusing data set, if you will. So we took some artistic license, and we just binned all my initial images um, into a pile. And a lot of them came up as being a uniform animal. So the animal, from one end of the animal to the other, it's the same thing. There's little or no contrast. Okay. When you put that on the right background, it blends in quite well. Other animals have what we call mottled pattern. It's light, light and dark, um, low contrast or moderate contrast speckles, so to speak. And when it's put on a background like that down here, it also uh, does a lot towards disguising the animal. But then there's this other category shown here. For disruptive coloration, we now have a very different outlay of large-scale, high-contrast, light and dark components, multiple orientations and scales, here partly to break up the recognizable form, but of course, as shown here on the right background, also creating a fair amount of background matching as well. Well, my lab had a lot of fun disguising me on that one, uh, but I hope you got the point. So they don't have 10, 20, or 100 camouflage patterns. They have three basic pattern templates, and they can do variation on each one of them. 
So now this makes it a little easier for the brain to make a fast decision. It only has to really decide on one of three or four basic pattern templates. So that's basically what we have found out. There's a lot of variation on each theme. I certainly emphasize this. So how common it might this be, this idea that there are only three basic camouflage patterns? Well, we assembled a whole bunch of pictures of different animals, all the way from primates and amphibians and uh, fishes and insects and all the rest. And there's a lot of uniform coloration out there. This comes as no surprise, uh, really, to anyone. There's also a lot of mottled coloration shown here. We threw birds in as a group. We've got thousands of these pictures. And so there's a lot of mottled coloration. But the giant surprise was that there's so much disruptive coloration out there in the world. An extreme case being a panda bear. And you say, what, Hamlin's nuts, you couldn't possibly be a camouflage pattern. Well, it is, and there are good data on that now. And these animals, when they're arboreal, will be viewed against a bright sunlight morning. And so the white part of it is sunlight. The black part is equal to shadow. But you can't connect the dots and recognize it as a bear shape. That's part of how disruptive coloration works. So who cares about all this? Well, if nature has honed uh, only three basic camouflage pattern types, and I don't care if it's three or five or ten, I know that it's very few, and that's counterintuitive. The implication is that all predator visual systems that we know of might be fooled by three or a few basic tricks. That's biologically very exciting because it's not intuitive and there's got to be a neurobiological shortcut. Well, I was um, bold enough to publish all this in a rather high level journal. Uh, and uh, what I expected that, that it would be provocative, controversial. And yes, it was both. <laughs> That's how science works. But is it testable? And yes, we have tested it. And I'm going to show you how we've tested it. But first, I want to get off camo and show you some signaling. So here you have a beautiful octopus in the Indo-Pacific uh, changing dramatically from a somewhat camouflage pattern to a conspicuous pattern and back. Now you have the broad club cuttlefish showing this is real speed, uh, a, a dazzling display to a crab prey. And here's the flamboyant cuttlefish. Uh, and camouflage and now going highly flamboyant, if you will. And so there's a lot of diversity and change of appearance. So why is it all so fast? Um, you know, milliseconds, not seconds. So it turns out the fastest changes occur not during camouflage, but during sexual selection and secondary defense. Sexual selection when they're competing with another animal for a mate or doing courtship displays. Secondary defense is when camouflage fails and the predator's chasing them. So speed is particularly important in male-male fights when they're fighting over a female. I'll show you the video in a second. And again, secondary defense depends on speed and confusion. And then camouflage gets used the second time, even after it failed, in the secondary defense response. Okay, so how fast do they change and why? This is the full body pattern change. And I'll just point out here that these are octopuses uh, changing, you know, in, in about a second or less. That's one full second is right about a line right about there. Uh, cuttlefishes do the same thing, but both, most of it is for different kinds of behaviors. And these secondary defenses, as I just pointed out, are the fastest in each case. So let's go back to ultra fast signaling. Here is a squid, two squid fighting each other, two males. And there's the female, and they're fighting over the female. And so this one animal can change in just over one second its appearance. And now we'll just show that in real life, real speed. Change, 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 lots of change. Look at these two guys fighting like crazy. Their skin pattern is changing exceptionally fast. And so this is one way that we measure it. I took this video underwater in the natural habitat in Venezuela. Okay, so. To summarize my first part of the talk, camouflage is not looking exactly like the background. There are just too many backgrounds out there. The right construct is camouflage only needs to deceive the visual system looking at it. This changes the framework dramatically. And counterintuitively, surprise, there may only be a few camo patterns out there. The idea is that we don't have enough database competing hypotheses yet to prove me and my team and collaborators wrong, but we have a lot of data to support what we're saying so far. The point is these animals have 
amazing diversity of how they can look for almost every behavior they do. Don't forget, these cephalopods are soft. They don't have a shell like other mollusks. And they're right in the middle of the food chain. Everything's eating them. So they've got to have another trick. That really changes their trick. So how do they guide all that change? That's the next thing. Well, it takes a big brain. And the octopus brain is extraordinary. This is a real brain dissected out. Here's a diagram of one of these brains. And the point is that there are 34 lobes in that brain. Uh, they have short and long-term memory. They have some really exquisite behavioral capabilities with this brain. But also the color change is all manifest and controlled through the brain. So there's a lot of complexity there. Uh, there are two newly discovered oddities out there, and that is the octopus genome was just uh, published about four years ago. The squid genome, uh, it just came out this year. Um, and they have huge genomes, absolutely huge. And the most extraordinary thing of all is that um, they have this um, crazy ability to edit RNA at an accelerated pace compared to any known animal. Uh, and so the RNA editing can develop a lot of proteins uh, to build things. And most animals go from DNA to RNA, and then there's just one kind of conversion, translation, transcription, and you get a protein. The cephalopods, they take that middle step and they race it up. And we don't know exactly what they do with it, but most of it's for the nervous system. So this is really an odd animal group for sure. Okay, so to change color, you need to have a sensor. These animals have magnificent eyes, keen vision, and then they have the skin that can uh, really make themselves look different. So here's the cuttlefish conspicuous out in the wild, decides just to hunker down and disappear. And so it just changes its body pattern to match the surrounding substrate. So before and after is pretty dramatic. Okay, now in the laboratory, we want to study this. So we put a cuttlefish right there in a chamber and it's camouflaged on a sandy bottom. We rudely pull the rug out from under it. It's got a different substrate underneath it. Now it looks at that substrate. It's pretty riled up because this is real time. Now the animal turns into a mottled pattern, which is pretty good too. But instead of letting it sit there for a few moments, we also do the next trick. And you see from the top right, our special talented three-handed technician drops in these white rocks from heaven. The animal looks at the white rocks and changes instantly to a disruptive camouflage pattern. Now, this is crazy because if the animal had stayed down there in a mottle pattern, 90% of the visual field would blend it into the mottle background. But instead, 20% of the visual field, just these white rocks, is a stronger cue and tells the animal to go into a different kind of camouflage, which is to produce its own white rock in the middle of its back and look unlike a cuttlefish. So, you know, what cue did they use? That's what we're after. So the idea is that how do we do this? So in the lab, we have a colony of cuttlefish in our lab year round. Uh, we produce some kind of background because we're exploiting one behavior they have, which is to camouflage in any background you give them. And so we treat the brain as a black box, which means that the animal is totally intact. We don't have to stick needles in it or ablate it or anything else. The animal just gives us the answer in its appearance, the body pattern. So if we put a cuttlefish on a uniform background, uh, it shows a uniform pattern. If we give it tiny little checkerboards, it has changed its appearance. And if we make those checkerboards higher contrast and larger, the animal has gone from model to disruptive camouflage. So uniform the model to disruptive, you see the animal pattern is very different. So what cues were, were embedded there? Well, I'm not gonna um, bore you with so many details. I'm gonna tell you one of the key answers right away. Down here on the checkerboard, when the checkerboard, when the white checker is about the size of the white checker that the animal can put on its back, which is a true physiological unit, then the animal will use that simple cue. They'll cue on the white one. They don't pay attention to the black one. They pay attention to the white one. And when it's the same area as that, that's the simple cue to go disruptive coloration. We never thought it was going to be such a straightforward speed mark, but it is. And um, so the whole idea is that the animal only needs three visual cues to turn on their patterns. And that's an extraordinary shortcut in neurobiology and evolution. Okay, so the ultimate goal is to develop an algorithm of how the eye does this. So there I am diving again, and we do a lot of field imagery, a lot of live animal things that I just told you about, because that visual display of the animal's appearance is a 
direct reflection of the neural activity in the brain. This is a very convenient bioassay. Then we take the psychophysics approach. We not only give them natural backgrounds, but we use these unnatural backgrounds like checkerboards, and we've done hundreds and hundreds of these called a psychophysics approach, where you give a specific visual stimulus and we see a specific motor response. Okay, so we've answered a lot of these questions. I'm just going to answer them for you. Uh, which stimuli vision needs the three types? I already told you about the disruptive. Um, do they prefer certain substrates? No, these animals can go anywhere out there, whether it's in the lab or underwater, and they can camouflage right away, not constrained. What about conflicting info? You know, <laughs> their eyes are where our ears are, and so they don't see the same thing. So the brain gets different input. What if the left side of the animal says go model, right animal, the right side of the animal says go disruptive, what does the animal do? Well, they never do half and half because any predator will see that. Um, what they do is they create a hybrid pattern very quickly. So that takes a brain, a big brain. Uh, what about 3D background objects? Are they important for the animal to cue on versus 2D? Yes, they are. The animals live in a three-dimensional background, so they pay attention not to the flat bottom as much as they do the vertical, vertically oriented background near them. Can they uh, do this all at night? Yes, we've proved this in the field in the lab. They got great night vision. Um, they do it the same as during the middle of the day. What about that skin control? Those big bumps in the skin we could call papillae. I'll show you a little more of that. But yes, this is all controlled by the brain and controlled visually as well. And I'll show you an experiment on that. What about the arm postures? Because not only do they um, uh, show a pattern in the body, but their arms, especially with an octopus or a squid and a cuttlefish, they do a lot with their arms and it's all visually controlled. And how do they achieve colorblind camouflage? What do I mean by that? Well, they're color coordinated in the background, the predators have color vision, but as far as we or anybody can tell experimentally, these animals are colorblind. So somehow this is a, an enigma that we cannot figure out yet, uh, but they can do it somehow. Um, okay, well, lots more questions here. Is motion camouflage possible? Yes, it is. I might show you one example of that. Now here's about the arm posture. You see the cuttlefish right here. When it's under some kind of, you know, stringy, stripy coral like this right here, the animals will raise their arms up. I saw this diving and we said, what's that all about? So in the laboratory, we put the animal in a round arena and then we put a, a poor proxy for a piece of algae, just a plastic thing. The animal swam all the way across the tank, sat right next to it and put its arms up. And we went, wow, that's weird. Uh, and then we did a photograph of it on the wall. The animal came across the tank and put its arms up. And now um, that was the same thing. There's the photograph. So we said, well, what are we gonna do with this? Can they really do this? I mean, it seems incredible. So I had a, a very irreverent grad student one weekend decided to do the experiment. This, that was good irreverency, by the way and put these bold black stripes on in a black wall. The animal put on some stripes. And then she put the stripes on the wall all the way around. The animal put broader stripes on here. And then she did the really cool thing and she made these stripes around the wall vertical. And it's hard to see here, but it's easy to see on the side shot. The animal raised up its first pair of arms perfectly in line with the bold stripes. And then she quickly, within minutes, did the next test and the animal, in fact, lowered its arms on the 45 degree angle. Well, this is not an experiment, uh, but it is a guide to say, let's do an experiment, which we did, it took about a year to do this, in which case, uh, when there was no striping in the background, the animals had its arms down, shown here. When we gave horizontal stripes, the animals lifted their arms up, put them straight out, pretty good um, um, results right there. And then we went to the old 45 degree one. And again, the animals really put their arms up. And then we went to this one where they were vertical and the animals are straight up. People always ask, why do we have to do so many animals to do statistics? Because this guy right here did not get the picture. That's 90, not 45. <laughs> so this is why we have to do so many experiments. Okay, so we've reviewed all of this over 12 years of work experiments every week, literally 800 cuttlefish, 25 published journal papers. Uh, what I've just told you is based on that. So we're not just uh, making things up, which we never do. Uh, here is something that's too complicated for this talk, but I just want to point out that 
We know the optic lobe in the brain is the one that receives the visual information, and it looks for these characters. It's looking at the edge, the contrast, and the intensity, and the scale of whatever is in the background. And then what happens is the animal, you know, makes a pattern selection, one of three patterns, and then it actually, oops, excuse me, got a little jumpy there. There we go. And then it actually generates the pattern in the skin, and then you get a final pattern that it does. All of this is happening in the brain in milliseconds. So it is a speed machine all the way. So, okay, so part number two, we'll finish here. We've simply figured out a behavioral assay that's non-intrusive to get a lot of these data. Vision is guiding all of this, it seems, uh, including the 3D papillae and the arm postures. We didn't really expect that. There's variation in each of the pattern types, which is very important, but we've not been able to tease that out. It took us, what I showed you a little while ago, a lot of effort to get where we are. This is going to take even longer to get the details out. And importantly, the light, there's light sensing capability in the skin, which you know we haven't done too much work with, but it might help the process. It might help the eyes, in other words, to make this decision. Okay, well, what about the motor output? Now, this is... This is getting maybe a little more interesting because we all like to have a shirt that changes color. How are we going to do this? How do the animals change their appearance um, so readily and so variably? There are a lot of patterns and fast changes. Here's a cuttlefish that I filmed at night in Sydney, Australia. Look at the skin carefully. There's these little waving bands. There are uh, thin horizontal or transverse markings. There's a little bit of whiteness in there. The animal can now go to a little bit of a yellowy color and produce a white large band here and then it will just flop on the bottom. This is like a lunar module landing and there there's the camo. Well here's the control system. This is a schematic of the brain the eyes of the animal. The brain is right between the two eyes and so these large optic lobes shown only one of them right here. Information comes in the optic lobe which is actually a decision making element as well as visual processing. That information goes to an intermediate brain center labeled number two here. And number two guides the left side and the right side. And in each of those, it sends down neurons to the lower motor center of the brain, which sends individual neurons from that part of the brain all the way out to the end organ, every spot in the animal without any synapse, which means that it's built for ultimate speed. So the whole thing is absolutely built for speed. Okay, now, how did they do this? There are these, not an endless number of appearances they can give you, but the patterns are made up of a, a limited set of building blocks, if you will. For disruptive coloration, there are 11 of them. Uh, six of them are white markings, and five of them uh, are dark markings. And for those 11 combinations, they can come up with different appearances. So here are the five white components, you know, a white head bar, for example, or a white square. The dark components, various stripes and so forth, and modeling. So with those, we can play the game here of making a cuttlefish. So each one of these items at the top of the screen is commanded by one sort of central neuron in the brain that says, turn this on or turn that on. So we can build a cuttlefish here by taking that, and we can add that. And another neuron says, turn that on. Another one says, turn that on, and so forth, until we now have a cuttlefish. But it's not camouflage, right? That's easy to see. Not so easy to see when you put it on the right background. So look, highly conspicuous, but it's doing all kinds of visual tricks to partly blend into here, but also not be recognizable. So this is what we're beginning to learn, an individual process. I did convene a workshop uh, in 2010 where we brought together um, 11 panelists who represented art, biology, microscopy, imaging, modeling, and engineering. And we came up with some ideas about how camouflage really works and how complicated it is and what needs to be studied uh, in the future. And I taught a course at Brown University and Rhode Island School of Design on this basic thing. So we've been thinking a lot about the how, the what, the why, and the when. Um, we also brought the art community in. And we're actually, this is my only paper I've ever published in an art journal. Leonardo is an art journal, not a science journal. But they were very interested in seeing how these animals create patterns and how the skin might work uh, to create those patterns with different pigments and reflectors. 
So this was fun, but also uh, quite important to my colleagues who work in the art world, especially at RISD. Okay, let's talk about the skin. It's a three-layered system. The top layer are these pigmented chromatophores. There are three color classes. These are like paints. There's a yellow and a red and a brown, and they're layered just like this. And the next mid-layer has all these reflectors. They're not pigments, they're reflectors. And they give you this iridescent sheen. And on the bottom layer is this whiteness that can act as a base layer for higher contrast things, but it does some other tricks as well. So with a three-layered system, some light will come in and go through three pigments and pop out and give you some color. Other bits of light will come through no pigments, will hit a reflector, and this one would come out green iridescence. Others will go through a brown pigment, maybe hit a little iridescence, hit this white spot and come out, and you get the idea with light coming in from different directions, you get a lot of color. There's a lot of color mixing. So it's those interactions. Now here are those spots, the chromatophores opening and closing. There's a brown one, there's a red one, and a yellow one. And so each one of these is a pigment sac, and when it's retracted, it's just a little spot and you don't see it, and it's pulled out into a flat disc by these radial muscles. And that's basically how it works. And so I'm going to skip that. Here's, here's an animation based on our ultrastructure work showing there's a framework underneath you can hardly see. We're pointing out that the skin does move in the live animal, but the chromatophore as it opens and closes maintains its color coherency because everything in this skin and organ is flexible. And engineers are just um, marvel at that and want to duplicate it because, you know, your fabric on your clothes, it wrinkles all the time. How do you keep it to look the same way if you're changing it? Well, we've done a lot of work on the skin. Uh, I mean, this is a little deep to go into this afternoon, but we can show these areas. The, the, here's a nerve cord, this red one coming down. These are these iridophore splotches here, here. There's a chromatophore right there. We really have done a lot of anatomy of the skin. It's really quite beautiful. And we figured out some generalities of how these giant nerve cords come in along, hit the bottom here, and they spread out, and they do these kind of circles around every chromatophore. It's like a, an expressway around the outside of nerve bundles. And so we don't know the peripheral nerve network yet, but we're working on it. Let's switch to the iridophores, the second layer down. These are structural reflectors. The same iridophores can be blue or pinkish red, depending on the angle of light that they're viewed from. And so they work differently. Here's a beautiful squid showing the iridescence underneath and a little bit in the arm. So the squids can do all of these tricks as well. And so we look at that skin now, and here we have iridescence coming out of nowhere. The little spots on here are the chromatophores not being uh, excited, but underneath we're stimulating a nerve fiber that stimulates only the spots. So there's nothing there. Here it comes. Notice the color shift from red all the way across the rainbow to blues and greens. So by neurally stimulating these spots, they turn on, and then with more stimulation, they change their color, which is really incredible. This, <laughs> This is not seen elsewhere in, in the animal kingdom to where you can actually get uh, this different structural color by neural control. Okay, here's an individual iridophore. Watch the color change in here. We'll play this one more time. We start over right now. Look at the mix of colors in there. And now it goes all the way over to predominantly blue. There are a lot of cells in there. So that's what you were seeing a moment ago in detail. So it's all these flat plates, and the light comes down and reflects off these individual plates shown here, and each of the plates has a special protein in it that reflects light. And what happens is, to turn it on, first of all, light will come through this one number five and not show anything because the reflecting material is all spread out. When it's co coalescing in number six, you get a pink and gold color, and now as these platelets get thinner and thinner, the dark ones, and the interplatelets white space gets larger and larger, it takes you right across the color spectrum. So here you have a physically controlled color tunable system. How convenient. What can we do with that? It's chemically tuned. We'll show you in a minute. Uh, we've got these beautiful skin papillae that I already showed you on the giant cuttlefish, smooth skin. And it's like periscope up, and you see those bumps. Those are individually controlled papillae. 
And now a close up on the same animal, I was able to film underwater and you go from totally smooth skin to this big bump. These are mus muscular hydrostats, kind of like a human tongue. Um, and uh, it works like this. This uh, thing, if you press it, you see it's a single unit, almost, almost like uh, a balloon full of water. That's actually a decent analogy. And it functions like that. And here's just a diagram. When you have muscles, green muscles this way, red muscles this way, blue muscles up and down or whatever, uh, by squeezing that unit, it's like squeezing a balloon at the county fair where they'll make different animal shapes by squeezing a balloon in different ways. This is how these skin papillae work. So that gives you morphing skin, which is really convenient for um, camouflage, but also you can flatten the skin to jet away fast. Don't you know the Navy would like to be able to do that, camouflage their submarines, but then to pull those big bumps down so they can go faster through the water. Well, anyway, it's all controlled by the animal, and it's not just one bump type. They have five different bump shapes that they can put up. Each one of them is controlled separately by the brain. It's a really cool system. Um, Anyway, we've done a lot of work on that, and I'm gonna show you in a minute some of our friends have made some fake ones, which is pretty neat. Okay, so to summarize part three, um, neurons control the chromatophores, but also control, much to our surprise, that iridescence. We didn't know that 10 years ago. Um, those iridescent cell bodies, um, they don't originate like the chromatophores do back in the brain. Out in the periphery, they have some cell bodies to control them. So the control, of the iridescence is a little bit different from the control of the pigmentary colored chromatophores. So that was a surprise. Um, and the papillae are dynamically controlled too, but we don't know the exact routing of that. The point, you keep hearing this over and over, it just seems to be built for speed. Okay, last thing, uh, bio-inspired routes. What can we do? What kind of toys can we make with this? Um, years ago, 2014, nine years ago, um, Lydia Madger and I in the lab were, were contacted by this information display uh, trade magazine. And uh, here it is, is this the future of display? They put our cuttlefish picture right, <laughs> right on the front cover. We were astounded by this. But we did write an article for this pointing out that there are ways to make things that change color based on animals. And so we did another article that was for the real biological science community. Um, where we looked at biological versus electronic adaptive coloration. When, you know, what the things that humans made make shown on the bottom here versus what the animals do can be shown in parallel at the organism or the system level. It, this is the product you get. You know, down at the device level, you got to have something to make the color change. And now at the lower level, even that, you get down to the cellular or the pixel or materials level. We tried to find out the commonalities and what was missing. And one thing we came up with was this right here, showing various things that when engineers want to make stuff, they're interested in the dark state, the color, the flexibility, the surface texture, and so forth. And we matched up what the cephalopods do well in green or don't do well versus in blue, what material science community does. And we found one notable thing where the cephalopods are really flexible um, compared to anything that people can make engineers and when human engineering. So this is an area where you could look at maybe inspiring some different ways to make materials based on what the animal does. That's the nature of the collaboration. Okay, so here's a smartphone right here. Everybody listening to me probably owns one. And the whole question is, where does the color and pattern come from in your cellular phone? And so all the colors are there. It takes a battery, which is very expensive. The instrument itself is very expensive. The battery runs out every day. My point is that the animals we work on can produce all the colors and patterns and contrast of a mobile phone, but they don't, they don't, what's the best way to put this? They are generating and making all of that light, whereas the animals are not generating or making any light, they are manipulating the available light that's falling on their skin. And man-made projects, Women made products do not do that. We don't take advantage, except in rare cases, of the available light manipulated at the nano level and create some patterning. And that's what the animals are doing with pigments and reflectors. And I emphasize and because it's the two together that animals do so well to do this. Here's just some examples of the skin of our animals. And you can see you can, you can make any design you want 
out of that three-layered skin system. So maybe this will inspire engineers to do something differently. Um, I'm going to almost skip this. This is to point out that there are yellow, red, and brown chromatophores, which I said already. We've actually measured it with spectrometers in great detail, and you can see the exact curve shape of each of the colors of the three pigments. And so, uh, believe it or not, even though Aristotle talked about the chromatophores of cuttlefish, you know, a long time ago, only recently as a colleague of mine uh, actually done the study and figure out what that pigment is. That's kind of a delay there. And that person is Layla Duravi, shown here. She's at Northeast University. A really, really talented young chemist who does a lot of materials engineering. She's looking at the natural system of the chromatophores in the skin, and she's making similar kinds of color changing cells. Um, uh, this is not her work. I chose someone else's work, but she's done the same thing. There's a lot of, there are quite a few labs in the country. I'll just show you quickly. Here's her lab right here. There's Layla doing, making electrochromic displays. Um, here's another group um, making artificial chromatophores, you know, with light triggered nanoparticles. Uh, here's another group doing biomimetic chromatophores uh, and so forth. There are a lot of people trying to make these artificial chromatophores so they can get rich and make clothes and change color. Um, okay, now let's talk about the iridophores uh, for a moment. I already talked a little about them, but here are folks also working, led especially by Alain Gordetsky. Uh, he's also a colleague of mine now. We just hooked up in the last few years, uh, making uh, reconfigurable infrared camouflage coatings from the protein <laughs> that's in those plates that I showed you a moment ago. Uh, here's uh, his same group doing it uh, really different things. And again, again, look at, we never thought that a protein that helps you change color and a squid or an octopus can stimulate neural stem cell growth. So the, the biotechnology here is stunning. Uh, some of these ideas are so far out, but they actually work, many of them. And I give credit to my colleagues at the Air Force Research Lab who came up with this beautiful paper, 2007, where they found that protein called reflectin that is, you know, being used a lot now as a real protein put in different materials. These guys were able to put this protein itself onto a thin film and the protein self-organized into a thin film and reflected light. No cell structure or anything. Really stunning work uh, that they've done. Okay. All right. Leucophorus is the, the bottom layer. And so if the whiteness is very important, there's the white square and the white head bar and a cuttlefish. We've measured all this. It turns out to be some of the whitest white measured in the animal kingdom. And they're doing it in that bottom layer of skin. Here's the bottom, here's the skin of a live cuttlefish. And they, the whiteness is, you know, in different shapes. And I'm gonna take a stimulating electrode and place it here and then place it on top of the white. And every time I place it, only certain pigments cover it to help enhance the whiteness. So this is a simple system whereby the animals can control the top layer of pigments versus the underlying level of bright white uh, reflectors to give you contrast control, dramatically different. So we have looked at those white cells called leucophores. Leuco means white and four means cell. And we've actually reconstructed out of a single cell all 12,000 protein spheres and been able to model that in detail with colleagues from Texas A&M University. Uh, and when you do that, you learn how to get this pure whiteness from the reflective protein. It models very well. Maybe emulate that for a better Kindle, you know, the Kindle reading book that a lot of us know about that does use available light, at least in the black and white world. It doesn't do it in color. But it could be a better makeup base. I'll show you in a minute. That's not as crazy as it sounds. And this seems to reflect, we're not sure of this, into the UV. Uh, it could possibly be a natural protein sunscreen but we'll see if that works out or not. Okay, uh, now here's an example where someone took our evidence for color blindness in the animals and we couldn't prove it, but uh, this is just showing how we could light up that reflective protein or the opsins in the skin, sorry. Um, and we, we weren't able to show that the opsin molecules in the skin, which are the same opsin molecules in the retina could detect light. But this very um, well-known guy named John Rogers, a real genius, looked at the idea from a talk I gave at a joint meeting, and he said, hey, 
you can't prove what those options of the skin do, but I can use the idea to make a flexible display that will imitate that and will sense what's near it or underneath it and, and change its pattern. So he actually made a flexible set of electronic devices in the skin. And at the juncture of each one of these squares, he put a tiny little lens that would look at what's underneath it. And this bottom thing, part E, says U of I, that's University of Illinois. That's where these guys are from. He made this thing so that it would sense what was under it on this rod, uh, the letters University of Illinois. And without a computer or a power source, it duplicated that in the skin. And this got published in a very esteemed journal because it was just a breakthrough in flexible electronic engineering that produces color. So there's some really talented people out there taking these ideas from our animal group and doing neat things with it. So um, I gave a TEDx talk. I was invited by the um, Estee Lauder Cosmetic Company in New York, and I uh, gave a talk to their 50,000 employees. <laughs> Didn't know they had that many. Anyway, the whole idea was, uh, why are they inviting an octopus guy to a um, cosmetics thing? Well, there was the title of my talk, Nature's Cosmetic Champions, The Octopus's Garden of Dynamically Changeable Pigments Reflectors. Uh, so thank you, Elizabeth, for pleasing the Beatles song at the beginning. <laughs> it is an octopus's garden. Uh, and my message to all of them was that we, we, we do actually have uh, the possibility of using pigments reflectors out of our animals to actually do things uh, with those pigments reflectors, even, even for human use. So changeable complexion. And, you know, in the animal kingdom, it can mask hard edges which you want to do in cosmetics and elsewhere. Uh, there are lots of gradations of color and contrast. And, you know, if you look at the animal kingdom in general, both land and sea, there's an incredible gold mine of pigments and reflectors being used that are not being studied for what they do in terms of optical physics. And this is a wide open area. And the whole idea is that these animals are manipulating available light and doing things. They're not creating light. We spend all of our time creating light like on all the displays, everyone's watching this presentation. There are other ways to go about it. Um, okay, so soft actuators. I'm going to say something quickly about papillae, you know, the bumps. Um, great, great demand for this, especially in medicine, but in all sorts of ways that can be used. The problem is that artificial muscle has not been really well uh, developed yet. So, so what are we going to do? We look at the cephalopod, which does it in a very different way. And so... Uh, we have, here's that cuttlefish on the left that I showed you earlier. We have mapped out every shape and type of bump they have in the skin, different kinds of papillae. Um, and each one of the 10 to 12 types is separately controlled by the nervous system. So you get a lot of diversity in appearance. And we've actually tested this in the lab by putting cuttlefish down on background and looking at how many skin bumps they use in different camouflage things. Then we put glass underneath. The whole idea was, are they visually sensing the background or are they physically touching the background to feel how bumpy it is and then to make their skin equally bumpy? And so this experiment showed that that doesn't work because once you even put a photograph of it underneath where they can't possibly touch it and they can only see it, they still do the same thing as if it were the real deal. So they're using vision uh, to guide the bumps in their skin. No clue how they do that. That seems too complicated. But former uh, uh, postdocs in my lab uh, led this study here where we looked at the control of those bumps in the skin. And they have one set of neurons that turn it on. This is the on nerve. It takes about six seconds. But a whole second set of neurons to turn it off. And in most cases, you expect the on nerve is going to turn it off. And when it's not stimulating, you'll go to the off level. No, wrong. They have separate nerve groups for each one of these with maximum control of every degree of freedom. So it's really quite sophisticated. Okay, we already showed you that. Uh, my friends at Cornell, Rob Shepard, uh, led this charge here and published in Science. He looked at the idea of a, a bump of papilla uh, from an octopus, the work that we did, and he created the first uh, bumps in the skin that can be controlled to every degree of freedom like we found in the animal. And so that was a breakthrough experiment uh, as well. That's what it got in science. Okay, so the summary, uh, and we're just about finished now. The skin inspires new avenues 
uh, to look at applications. You know, it's manipulating light in a different way. Could you make a better Kindle? Maybe. Uh, could make more efficient electronic displays? Certainly use ambient light to help with that and how it combines pigments and reflectors. How about flexible displays? Wouldn't you love a laptop that you could roll up and pull it up and put it in your pocket and then unwrap it and use it again? You know, this is what you can do with cephalopod skin. We can't do it with our displays yet. Uh, changeable colors and shapes of clothes and cars and anything you can think of. Uh, that's very hard to get in human society and industry now. And maybe the animals can show us how to do this. Even stuff as far out as making changeable cosmetics that would a person could control to some degree uh, themselves. Again, that's the feed um, in most cases human vanity, but there are also many medical cases like vitiligo where you want to cover up uh, scars and so forth. And a lot of potential applications in cosmetics and, and medicine. Okay, the quickest of summaries, um, sensory ecology. It, um, you know, we got to understand what animals sense before we can understand their ecology. And, and we need to wrap our conservation efforts around what the individual animals can sense so we understand how they operate and what they need. This sounds sensible, at least to me. doesn't get used this way very often. Uh, biology has evolved just a few camouflage pattern types for multiple environments. That's pretty astounding, surprising. The cephalopod eyes have some streamlined rules to rapidly control those patterns. These were big surprises to the neurobiology community. What we've been able, we and our colleagues, we're not the only ones doing this, of course. The whole skin is built for speed. You've heard me harp on that probably too much. Pigments and reflectors uh, are the key thing, and most of it's untapped. There's a lot to learn out there in nature from this. So many questions, not enough answers. And with that, I'll be happy to stop and answer questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Roger. Um, so much to um, think about and unpack in all of that. Um, I have a question for you about, um, okay, so if, if the cephalopod is colorblind and the predator is colorblind, what, are they simply cueing off of contrast um, to make these kinds of changes? What, what, what are they cueing off of if they can't detect the color? Well, uh, the clear answer is we don't know. <laughs> so, but we can speculate a little bit. First of all, most of their predators are not colorblind. They are color rich. Oh. Um, and, but there's a, lot of night, there's a lot of night predation going on. and you can, No animal can sense color at night. So, so that's operating in the black and white world. Contrast, yes, is a very, very key feature of this. And, you know, humans have very good contrast sensitivity, and predators do too. So they have to get the contrast right, even if it's seen in the black and white world or in the color world. Um, so uh, to me, it's just astounding. We're, we're measuring this much more carefully now to really find out how concisely or precisely uh, the color in the animal matches the background. I mean, I... I have a photo library underwater of over 100,000 images. And, but this is in the RGB space of humans. You know, our instruments mm -hmm. only do red, green, and blue. There are 300 colors available technically from 400 to 700 nanometers. And many animals have peak sensitivity elsewhere in that rainbow of colors. Uh, and so we're, we're now using hyperspectral imaging. And that's just the fancy name for a camera that has a lot of colors in every pixel, not just three. And we're doing that under natural light trying to understand a little better what these animals might look like uh, and whatever color they show to different predators with different color capabilities. That's a key eco ecological question. But it doesn't get back to the colorblind thing. We still don't know how the animals could match color when they can't perceive color. That just remains an enigma. And so it's, uh, we studied it. We got a large grant with a lot of colleagues around the country, big team efforts. And we really came up with no clear answers about that okay. particular issue. So, you know, nature is so wonderfully sophisticated. I'm actually glad half the time that we can't understand it. I think it's a good humbling thing to realize what a beautiful planet we live on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, thinking about that kind of uh, wider view, um, uh, 
are there, uh, I assume there are researchers who are looking at uh, similar things in uh, terrestrial animals, chameleons and things like that. Uh, do you know if they're coming up with similar kinds of findings? You mean for the pattern design or how they change color or both? Uh, both. For the pattern design, yes. They're, they're, they're about, um, for a long time, camouflage wasn't studied uh, very much. Uh, and it was only in the last 15 years. Everyone just thought camouflage is looking like the background. Oh, that's boring. We know about that. So the scientific literature is pretty thin, very thin. Uh, starting about 20 years ago, a uh, few teams got interested in this. Mine was one of about three or four others in the world who just independently got interested in camouflage. And most of those groups are terrestrial, not, not underwater. They're not aquatic. Yes, we're finding out very much the same thing. We now have, just in the last 20 years, an uh, almost immense and very rich uh, publication repertoire to go to of folks. These are really good research teams, too. Uh, looking at this question of pattern design, how many patterns are there, how does camouflage really work, how do predators see them, measuring this with field and lab studies. So yes, we're, we're finding a lot of commonalities between the aquatic world and the terrestrial world when you account for how water influences light. There are some influences different from air, but we can account for those and quantify them. So yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a wonderful um, international collaboration going on with some good research teams doing different animal groups and asking a wide array of questions. Uh, it's really a very wonderful time to be studying this because um, there's a lot of interest in it and there's a lot of practicality to it as well. It's got, you know, if you, in natural selection, camouflage is, is in almost every taxon we know of. It's one of the most universal traits of animal biology but it's grossly understudied. And now folks who are getting into it are really hitting some hard questions. So really exciting time going on in terms of uh, vision and visual perception and color and contrast. You know, all of these things come into play. So it brings in a lot of collaborators from different fields. Fantastic. Um, th th there, there's a, uh, a comment in the chat Thank you, fascinating, truly out of this world and beyond. <laughs> so I, I agree. You know, we, we, we're, we're convinced that, uh, I say it all the time, the cephalopods, they're just weird. They really are totally different the way they do things. And, you know, they're a mollusk. You know, they're related to oysters and clams, for Pete's sake. They're in the same phylum. And frankly, I never believed it till I saw the DNA <laughs> matches. But... But the point is they've gone a totally different uh, direction uh, in their evolutionary pathway. And they got rid of all that exterior armor, all that shell, they get rid of all that. And what they're left with is this big hunk of protein, their body, uh, and they have to use their wits, which is a big brain, and their behavior and their color change uh, manifest uh, all of their behavior. So they, to do that, they've had to develop some systems that got developed to the hilt because of their odd body shape and their susceptibility to predation. So um, it really is a very weird animal group, but they do some things that we're interested in, like change our appearance. So what can we learn from their tricks? That's kind of the approach here, the practical approach. Wow. Um, we have another question. Is there a difference in deep and shallow waters for these traits to manifest? Yes, because light's different uh, near the surface and down deep. So as light penetrates the ocean, um, the ocean is blue for a good reason, because a lot of the uh, longer wavelength red colors and so forth get attenuated. Um, and so the deeper you go, the bluer it gets. Uh, light penetrates from the surface down to about 900 feet, give or take 100 feet. And so that light, you know, any, any of us who have been even in a swimming pool, much less the ocean, if you have something bright red and you just dive down 10 feet or 15 feet, it's, it's already losing its red. And, you know, shortly thereafter, at 20 or 30 feet, it just turns to black because the red wavelengths get attenuated out. So color gets affected a lot by the distance it goes through water. That's for sure. So when you get down to, you know, 100 feet diving or 200 feet or 500 feet, I don't suggest anyone dive to 500 feet. Uh, but the point is that you're, you're losing uh, more and more color and it's changing. 
Now, when you get down to the dark abyssal regions, animals create their own light with bioluminescence. And bioluminescence is basically a blue-green color. And animals have figured out ways to create light in those unlighted environments. And so the animals down there, their eyes are tuned not to the whole color spectrum because it's not present. Those deep sea animals are attuned to the blue-green wavelengths. They see all kinds of detail in blue-green that we'll never be able to perceive in our vision. So, yeah, it's very different from shallow uh, to deep, and that's both in freshwater and saltwater. Absolutely fascinating. <laughs> I, I can see why you can spend a, an entire career on just this, <laughs> or, or all of this. That's a better way of putting it. So, well, we do have fun with the diversity. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Roger. Um, we're going to um, have to leave it here, but um, just a note um, to uh, all our viewers, um, we will be back with another lecture two weeks from today on uh, Sunday, January 22nd. That lecture is entitled All About Alvin. Alvin, of course, is uh, one of the world's uh, oldest, if not the oldest, uh, mm. deep sea submersible. Um, so we're going to hear from uh, some of the folks at um, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute uh, about um, uh, Alvin's history and um, research that um, uh, Alvin's been involved with uh, recently. So um, we hope that you will join us back here for that. So uh, until then, stay well. We hope you have a wonderful uh, rest of the weekend, and we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.